purpose does the gentleman from Indiana seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I move to suspend the rules and pass H.R. 668 to amend Section 1105A of Title 31, United States Code, to require that annual budget submissions of the President to Congress provide an estimate of the cost per taxpayer of the deficit and for other purposes. The clerk will report the title of the bill. H.R. 668, a bill to amend Section 1105A of Title 31, United States Code, to require that annual budget submissions of the President to Congress provide an estimate of the cost per taxpayer of the deficit and for other purposes. Pursuant to the rule, the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Messer, and the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Van Hollen, each will control 20 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Indiana. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days within which to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous material on H.R. 668 currently under consideration. Without objection, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Indiana. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I first, I want to thank Budget Committee Chairman Paul Ryan and Ranking Member Chris Van Hollen for allowing the House to consider this measure, which will require the President's annual budget submission to, to Congress to include the cost per taxpayer of the deficit. For each year, the budget is projected to result in a deficit. This bill is based on one simple principle that each hardworking American taxpayer deserves to know how much the deficit costs them each year. This requirement would be a powerful reminder to the President and Congress that our decisions have real-world consequences for hardworking taxpayers. It's long past time to hold Washington accountable for its wasteful spending. The massive national debt has ballooned to an unsustainable level because Washington has refused to make tough choices. Instead, simply spending money we don't have and ignoring the explosive growth of entitlements. This abdication of responsibility is delaying the inevitable until there may not be any good choices left. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to stop here and reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves the balance of his time. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Maryland. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, as one of the earlier speakers says during the one minutes, um, this bill simply requires a math calculation, and we have absolutely no objection uh, to doing that. As the gentleman may know, about a month ago, uh, we passed an amendment that, that did virtually uh, the same thing. I, I do wonder why it is we think the President's better with a calculator than Congress, because what this does require simply is that you take the deficit and you divide it by the number of uh, taxpayers. But uh, we're certainly fine to have transparency and have the President uh, put that in his budget as part of his uh, submission uh, as well. Uh, our concern is that this really doesn't address the fundamental question uh, that we're facing uh, here in the Congress. Uh, number one, making sure we get the economy kicked into full gear and jobs. Uh, and number two, reducing the deficit in a smart and balanced way over a period of time so that we're not balancing the budget on the backs of our seniors, that we're not violating commitments we've made to our seniors, that we're not cutting into education funding for our kids, which is important to uh, making sure that the economy grows and that they have opportunities in their lives, uh, and that we do that in a smart way that doesn't, in the process, result in fewer American jobs. So the real number we should be focused on here today is 750,000, because 750,000 is the number of jobs that the independent nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office says will be lost so long as the sequester that began March 1st remains in place through the end of this year. So let me say that again. So long as the sequester that started on March 1st remains in place through the end of the calendar year, the independent nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office says that we will have 750,000 fewer American jobs. It's not President Obama's number. It's not my number. It's an independent number. And the chairman of the Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke, was on the Hill testifying just last week and made similar predictions. They have both, both Fed, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke, as well as the Congressional Budget Office, say that our economic growth between now and the end of the year will be reduced by a full one-third if this sequester 
remains in place. So that's what this House should be doing. And today, a little later today, for the fourth time this year, for the fourth time this year, Mr. Speaker, I will go on behalf of my colleagues in the Democratic Caucus to the Rules Committee and ask for the opportunity to vote on a piece of legislation that would replace that sequester in a smart and balanced way and in a way that doesn't result in 750,000 fewer American jobs. Now, you would think our colleagues would want to vote on something like that instead of voting on a bill that just requires a math, ca math calculation, which, which is fine, but doesn't do anything about jobs and doesn't actually do anything to reduce uh, the deficit. But we've not been given that opportunity. Uh, so I would just ask my colleagues, why is it so important to bring a bill to the floor that asks the president to do another mouth calculation, which we all can support, and not bring to the floor of the House a bill that actually would prevent the loss of 750,000 jobs and present a balanced plan to reducing the deficit uh, in a way that doesn't harm the economy? That really is the question uh, here today, Mr. Speaker, and maybe at some point we'll get an answer, and, and maybe this House will live up to its promise to be the People's House and the Transparency House, and we'll actually get a vote on our fourth request. Uh, I'm not holding my breath, but, but it would be nice if um, those commitments were kept as well. I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves his time. The gentleman from Indiana is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Priest, uh, Mr. Speaker. Appreciate Representative Van Hollen and his comments. As he well knows, this uh, chamber has twice considered sequester replacement bills put forward by the House Republican leadership, voted on and passed out of this chamber. The alternatives are clear. I appreciate his, uh, his recognition that this simple little calculation while admittedly not a, uh, going to change the, uh, the, the planet Earth, it is important in providing budget transparency and helping the American tax taxpayer understand how much money we're spending here. We often hear, as you're out in town hall meetings, how much is a trillion dollars? And what this bill simply shows is that if you take a trillion dollars, if that's the, the, the deficit in a given year and divide it by the 145 million taxpayers we have, it adds up to about $6,800 a taxpayer that we're adding to our debt every year. And back where I come in India, from from an Indiana 6th Congressional District, that's a lot of money. He cited the number 750000 and I would concede that $85 billion is a lot of money. Uh, but it represents about 2 percent of what we spend as a nation uh, every year in our $3.6 billion budget. I came to the House floor yesterday and held up two pennies, representing the two cents, the two percent, the two cents out of every dollar that we're asking Congress to trim out of our federal budget. And does anybody in America really believe that our federal government is so efficient and so effective that we can't afford to trim, to trim two cents out of every dollar? Now, clearly we can do this in a more sensible way. I know of no one in either chamber who is not arguing that we ought to find a more sensible way to bring these reductions forward. But we bring them forward, we must. Now, with that, uh, Mr. Speaker, I would like to yield one minute to the distinguished gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Garrett. The gentleman from New Jersey is recognized. And I thank the Speaker. I thank the gentleman. You know, right now, as we stand here, the national debt in this country stands over $16 trillion, and a third of that was rung up just during this President Obama's administration. And some outside experts says, what does that translate to you and me? Well, the average taxpayer may be in the uh, debt to of $111,000 to the U.S. government because of that. And on top of that, do you know that this is the fourth time that this White House, that this president, has failed to follow the law and to submit a budget to the House on time? But when he finally does, I really do hope that this budget differs from his other ones, which were riddled with um, red ink and absolutely had no intent to balance, not in five years, 10 years, 15 years, they never balanced. In short, his budgets have been an economic disaster. And because of that, maybe that's why there has been bipartisan opposition to his budgets. You know, in the Senate, which is democratically controlled, he got absolutely zero support for his budgets in the past.
So it's high time that this president gets serious about the deficits and acknowledges that we, the frivolous spending is uh, part of the problem and address the issues with appropriate budget. And I support this legislation before us. And I yield back. Would, uh, the gentleman from Maryland is recognized. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Speaker. Um, the floor manager mentioned uh, that two times uh, our Republican colleagues had put forth uh, an alternative to the sequester. I, I know the gentleman knows well that we're in a new Congress. Uh, and starting in January, uh, all the bills that were put forward in the last Congress were wiped off the books. They don't have any meaning at this point in time. Uh, and this year, since we've been in a new Congress, since the election, uh, the number of times our Republican colleagues have put forth a proposal to prevent that sequester to replace it is zero. Zero times in this Congress when it could actually make a difference. And yet today, for the fourth time, we're going to go and ask for a vote on our proposal. Now, we're not asking our colleagues to vote for our proposal, although I think that public surveys showed the overwhelming majority of the American people would think that our alternative to replacing the sequester is a lot better than the sequester. But we're not even asking our colleagues to vote for it. We're just asking for a vote on it. Let's let the People's House uh, do its work. Now, we talked about the deficit. There's no argument about the need to reduce our deficits. We just need to do it in a smart way and in a way that doesn't hurt the economy and doesn't cost jobs. And our proposal does that in a balanced way. It combines additional targeted cuts over a period of time with cutting tax loopholes that are in the code over a period of time. And our Republican colleagues keep talking about how bad the deficit is. We say we agree with you on that. But it apparently isn't bad enough that you would close one single tax loophole in order to reduce the deficit. In fact, that Grover Norquist pledge that's been signed by over 90 percent of our House colleagues says that you promise not to close a single tax loophole for the purpose of reducing the deficit. You can't get rid of a tax break for corporate jets. You can't get rid of the special treatment of hedge fund managers under the tax code if it's part of an effort to reduce the deficit. How is that serious deficit reduction? So what we've said is we need to do both. We need to eliminate a lot of those tax preferences and tax breaks for big oil companies and others. And we also need to make sensible targeted cuts in other areas and reduce the deficit in a smart way. And, and the alternative plan that we propose that we're asking for a, a vote on would accomplish the same amount of deficit reduction as the sequester through, this cal through the calendar year, but do it in a way that does not cost 750,000 American jobs because we don't do it so deeply so quickly. And that's the difference. And that's why bipartisan commissions have recommended the balanced approach uh, to reducing the deficit. So again, uh, the numbers for this year, which is the only thing that's relevant uh, in terms of congressional action, is that there have been zero effort, zero times, that our colleagues have brought to the floor a proposal to replace this question. We're now asking our fourth time this afternoon simply to have a vote. And uh, I hope we can finally get one, Mr. Speaker. The gentleman reserves his time. The gentleman from Indiana is recognized. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, I yield one minute to the distinguished gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Black. The gentlelady is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the gentleman for yielding. I rise today to speak in support of Congressman Messer's bill, H.R. 668. This requirement would be a powerful reminder to the President and Congress on how the decisions regarding our government's spending impact the constituents that we serve. Despite the fact that on the President's watch, we have had four straight years of deficits exceeding $1 trillion, and we still have nearly 23 million Americans who are struggling to find work, the President continues to champion more and more deficit spending as a cure to what ails our struggling economy. But spending money we do not have is not an investment. It's a liability that limits the potential and the freedom of the American people and future generations. Every man, woman, and child in America currently owes 
$52,000 as their share of the national debt. It's time that the President and Congress level with the public about the burden of debt that's being placed on the American taxpayer each and every year. I yield back. The gentleman from Maryland is recognized. I, I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves his time. The gentleman from Indiana. Mr. Speaker, I yield two minutes to the distinguished gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Rakita. The other gentleman from Indiana is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today in support of this important legislation offered by my good friend from Indiana. You know, for more than two years now, my colleagues and I have led a family discussion across this country about our debt and deficits. Our current national debt stands at over $16.5 trillion and increases by $4 billion per day. We have $100 trillion, Mr. Speaker, in unfunded promises coming down the pike. But many Americans, including some members of this distinguished body, fail to understand is that these numbers have consequences. Our debt and deficits are not simply a series of numbers. They are a reflection of our morality as a people. And what our debt and deficits reveal is that for the first time in the history of this country, this generation is preparing to leave the next worse off. And all we seem to be able to talk about, at least on one side uh, of this body, is how many times something was introduced last year versus this year and somehow expecting a difference. Einstein had something to say about repeating something and expecting a different result. Would anyone in this room be able to, hear, be able to stand here and argue that the, this choice, leaving the next generation worse off, is morally correct? Of course not. The out-of-control spending coming from Washington will have a devastating impact on future generations, our children and our grandchildren. I recently received a letter from a Boy Scout in my district by the name of Michael Crane who said he is, quote, concerned and disappointed in the job Congress has been doing in the handling of the budget, unquote. Unfortunately, Michael does not have a voice in this conversation. He is too young to vote, and of course his children that he will one day have have no voice, yet they will be paying this bill. That's why I support Luke Messer's bill to continue this conversation with the American people by simply saying to those of us who are taxpayers what we bear in terms of the cost for the government that we now have as inefficient and ineffective as it is. And I yield back. The gentleman from Maryland is recognized. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, as, as I pointed out earlier, but I think it um, bears emphasis, about one month ago we passed a virtually identical provision. So why we're back here on the floor of this House, again, without op opposition, I think everybody in this House voted to do this calculation and have it put on the books. So why we're here one month later when the sequester just kicked in, doing something that we already did, rather than focusing on the issue at hand, I think is a mystery to the American people. And uh, you know, folks who just read from letters they gotten from constituents, um, I think those constituents are going to be asking, why are you doing now what you did 30 days ago when we've got all these other Bernie issues on our plate right now? And at a time when we're asking for a vote <laughs> on a plan to replace the sequester in a balanced way uh, for the fourth time. And I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from Maryland reserves the balance of his time. The gentleman from Indiana is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I yield two minutes to the distinguished gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn. The gentlelady from Tennessee is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the chairman for, for the time. You know, uh, talking about burning issues, I don't know of anything that is more pressing than dealing with this nation's debt. You can go back through the pages and look at what Admiral Mullen had to say on July 6, 2010. The greatest threat to our nation's security is our nation's debt. That is the reason we are here. We're not here for ourselves. We're here for our children and our grandchildren and making certain that the America that they have, the future that they have, hope and opportunity that they have is going to be greater than anything that we ever possibly could have imagined for ourselves. And isn't that what preserving freedom for posterity is all about? It is about making certain that we hand over freedom, 
in good shape for another generation. I tell you, if you were looking at the debt clock, it's a pretty telling story, over $16.5 trillion. And yesterday, the per citizen share of that debt was $52,818. The per taxpayer share was $147,238. Now I know there are some in this body that would like to turn the debt clocks off in the hearing rooms. They just want to ignore it. And supposedly it would go away and we wouldn't have to talk about it. And we could just pretend that we do not have a spending problem in Washington, D.C. But, Mr. Speaker, that is not reality. That is being completely divorced from reality. In order to defeat a problem, you have to admit that there is a problem. There is a problem with spending in Washington. There is a problem with our nation's debt. I support the good work that has been done by my friend from Indiana and encourage all to vote for H.R. 668. The gentleman from Maryland is recognized. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Speaker. Listening to this debate on the floor, you might think that this bill did something to reduce the deficit and the debt. Just in case anyone's confused, it does nothing to reduce the deficit and debt. It does ask for a calculation, uh, which we agree with. In fact, the gentlelady just did the calculation herself, which begs the question why you need to go through a bill to get somebody to do the calculation. In fact, this calculation changes because, as the gentleman and all of us have said, the, the deficit goes up and that number changes every day. And so you got to do it every day. But the point is, we passed this a month ago. There's no objection to doing a calculation. But this bill does nothing, nothing to reduce the deficit. In fact, it's running up the deficit as we spend time, taxpayer time, right here on the floor of the House. While we continue to ask for a vote, up or down vote, on our plan to replace the sequester so that we don't lose 750,000 American jobs. Today will be the fourth time we've asked for this. Our Republican colleagues have not taken any action in this Congress, not one step, nothing, to replace the sequester. That's what we should be dealing with, not a bill that we passed a month ago, not a bill that the gentlelady did a calculation on the floor to achieve the result. Let's focus on jobs and reducing the deficit in a smart way by targeting spending cuts in a, in a smart way, but also getting rid of all those tax breaks that our colleagues seem so wedded to keeping in place. With that, I yield one minute uh, to the distinguished Democratic leader, Ms. Pelosi. The leader is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I thank the gentleman for yielding and for giving me this opportunity uh, to uh, support his proposal, Chris Van Hollen proposal, as our ranking member on the Budget Committee, uh, a proposal that is fair, responsible, and balanced. Uh, Mr. Van Hollen has put forth an initiative that cuts spending responsibly, ends unnecessarily and uh, wasteful tax breaks for special interest, and advances the Buffett rule, ensuring that millionaires pay their fair share. I think it's really important to note, as he did, that this would be uh, yet again another time we are coming to the floor asking for the Republican leadership to allow a vote in what they boast of an open Congress and, and uh, open to other ideas uh, that have blocked over and over again the mere consideration of, of Mr. Van Hollen's <coughs> excuse me proposal on the floor. Instead, today uh, we are engaged in subterfuge. What can we do instead of doing what we really need to do and make it look as if we're doing something responsible? Yeah, okay, let's get the calculation. But let's reduce that deficit. Let's reduce that deficit. And it's important to note that this debate happens in the week that we will be taking up uh, the uh, continuing resolution. It's four days since the sequester went into effect. The continuing resolution that the Republicans are putting forth is a bill that reinforces it uh, uh, re uh, enforces the sequestration. So what does that do? That Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke, take it from him, he said uh, he told Congress last week that the 
The cuts of this size made this quickly would hurt hiring and incomes, slow the recovery, and cost the economy 750,000 jobs this year and keep deficits larger than otherwise. So we're not reducing the deficit by what is really happening on the major legislation coming to this floor last week and this week in terms of sequester and continuing resolution. That's what we should be doing is figure out a way to get rid of the sequestration. What does sequestration mean? Whatever its Latin roots, it equals job loss. 750,000 by the estimate of the chairman of the Fed. And why are we, why, what, what is the point of all of this? There is an answer. We already have agreed in, this, in the continuing resolution, the President and the, and the Congress has agreed to $1.2 trillion in spending cuts. We all recognize we must reduce the deficit. We've all agreed to spending cuts of that magnitude. That was in addition to $400 billion of other spending cuts uh, in the last um, term of Congress. So $1.6 trillion in spending cuts, which dwarfs the $600 billion, as significant as that is, in uh, uh, the expiration of the Bush tax cuts at the end of last year. But we need more revenue, and there's a place to get it. Our distinguished speaker has said there's $800 billion in um, uh, uh, tax loopholes that could be closed. I think there's more than that. But many of those uh, many of the deductions that we would want people to take strengthen the middle class. I think we should separate them out from what the Republicans want to do. The Republicans in Congress are protecting tax loopholes, wasteful spending in the tax code that increases the deficit instead of solving problems. Instead of closing tax loopholes for big oil, cuts in, uh, the Republicans want cuts in Head Start for little children big oil over little children. Instead of closing tax loopholes for corporations that ship jobs overseas, 750,000 jobs will be lost here because of the sequester and the continuing resolution that contains the sequester uh, and, and that we're, the fix that we're in because of refuse, the refusal of the Republican leadership to close those loopholes. Instead of ensuring millionaires pay their fair share, our military readiness will be impaired. Our military readiness, we have kids that won't get the proper training unless the, re the Defense Department can reprogram uh, the money, proper training uh, to take them into harm's way. And health care for America's military families will be cut. So there's an answer to all of this, and that is that we need to close, stop the tax the spending in our tax code. Everybody talks about reducing spending as our colleagues on the other side of the aisle do. And we all agree that we need to reduce it. That's why $1.6 trillion in spending cuts and we can try to find more. But why can't we stop the spending on the tax code, the spending of tax giveaways? They're called tax expenditures. They cost the taxpayer. If you're so concerned about how much the, tax, uh, the, the deficit is costing every individual American, why, why don't we calculate how much the tax break for big oil, corporations sending jobs overseas, the list goes on and on, how much those tax expenditures cost America's working families. And they do so by increasing the deficit, by not creating jobs in our, uh, uh, in our own country. So, again, there is an answer here to be hopeful. We can come together to say, okay, we all agree, reduce the deficit, cut spending, make some changes that we can without hurting beneficiaries in uh, mandatory spending. But why, why, why are these tax loopholes for special interest such sacred cows for the Republicans? such sacred cows that they will not even allow Mr. Van Hollen's bill to come to the floor. Are they afraid of the debate? Are they afraid of the outcome of their vote? With that, I thank the gentleman again for his leadership on putting forth a balanced, fair uh, proposal to reduce the deficit, to avoid sequestration, which we didn't, uh, but as a counter uh, to uh, what the Republicans are, are putting forth, and more than a counter. It's about leadership, 
It's about what is possible if we can work together in a, in a bipartisan way to get the job done uh, for the American people. I thank you, Mr. Van Hollen, and yield back my time. You, the minority leader is reminded to address the remarks to the chair. <laughs> the from Indiana is recognized. Appreciate the eye contact. Um, the, um, let me make three quick points. First, as to the underlying merits of the bill, transparency matters. It matters that we let the American people know what is happening here. This calculation called for under the bill shows that in recent years we've been racking up $6,800 in debt for every American taxpayer each year. And that's a lot of money. Secondly, we've heard from folks on the other side of the aisle about the need to close loopholes. I would submit that there is broad consensus that we need major tax reform. There is broad consensus that the loopholes that our tax code is riddled with should go away. The question is, then what do you do with the money that comes from those reductions? Do you put it back in the American economy, help grow the economy? The best way to balance our budget and, 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 and get this House back in fiscal order is to have a growing economy with more tax payers who can therefore pay additional tax revenue because they have a job. Um, there's been a lot of talk on the other side of the aisle about the need for a balanced approach, but that balanced approach seems to ignore the fact that we had a $600 billion tax increase that passed this body on January one, the president promised in his campaign four to one spending reductions to tax increases. We're not yet even to one to one. And we talk in this chamber about balance. Mr. Speaker, um, I would like to yield two minutes to the distinguished gentleman from Florida, Mr. Bill Arrakis. The gentleman from Florida is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. I appreciate it, Mr. Mess. Thank you for following this very good bill. Mr. Speaker, Washington continues to spend money we don't have. As we all know, the federal uh, government borrows nearly 46 cents on the dollar, much of it from China, and we're sending the tab to our children and our grandchildren. What a shame. Across America, working families have had to tighten their belts, and it is past time for Washington to do the same. That's the bottom line. Ignoring runaway deficits and out-of-control spending is not an option. With a national debt of more than $16 trillion, Mr. Speaker, every American now has a $52,000 share. We must control spending so Washington will not saddle future generations with burdensome debts that crowd out the private sector and lead to increased taxes and higher interest rates. The lack of fiscal discipline and the rising cost of the federal debt have created a dangerous combination necessitating action to prevent Washington from dipping into the bottomless cookie jar. This legislation before us would simply require the President's budget submission to provide an estimate of the cost per taxpayer of the deficit the burden would run. This, the budget would run. This common sense legislation forces us to face this fiscal danger with eyes wide open. I support this good bill, this effort by my colleague, and I urge my colleagues to do the same. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The, the gentleman from Maryland. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. May I ask how much time remains on each side? The gentleman from Maryland has nine minutes. And the gentleman from Indiana has eight minutes. All right, Mr. Speaker. I, again, I, I have to remind uh, people as they listen to this debate that this bill does nothing, zero, to reduce the deficit. Nothing. All it does is ask for a calculation which we've said we welcome, which one of our members actually did on the floor of the House here uh, as she pr gave her presentation, uh, and that we can all do. But by all means, let's say to the President, put that calculation in your budget, even though that calculation is out of date three days after the budget uh, is submitted if we don't get a control of the deficit and do it in a smart way. Now, I agree with the gentleman when he says the best way to deal with the deficit is to grow the economy. That's what we should be focused on, which is why we're asking today for the fourth time for a vote 
on our proposal to replace the sequester so that we don't lose 750,000 jobs. 750,000 jobs is the number of jobs that were created between October of last year and January of this year. According to the chairman of the Federal Reserve, if we continue to allow that sequester to remain in place, we will see one-third less economic growth. Now, if you don't believe the nonpartisan independent head of the Congressional Budget Office, who does professional work, and if you don't believe the chairman of the Federal Reserve, who's not a partisan, maybe our Republican colleagues will believe the House Republican leader, Mr. Cantor. Here's what he said on the floor of this House not that long ago with respect to the sequester. I quote, under the sequester, unemployment would soar from its current level. He goes on to say it would set back any progress the economy has made. Mr. Cantor, he then referred to a study that said the jobs of more than 200,000 Virginians in my home state are on the line. That's Mr. Cantor. Here's what the Republican chairman of the Armed Services Committee said about a month ago. This is what Mr. McKeon said when we got the numbers from the last quarter showing the economy was slowing in part in anticipation of these cuts. Mr. McKeon said, quote, this is just the first indicator of the extraordinary economic damage defense cuts will do, unquote. And that's just the defense cuts. You've also got these across-the-board cuts in important investments in biomedical research to try and find treatments and cures to diseases that hit families throughout this country. You're going to be putting people out of work who do that important research for our country. And in the end of the day, in addition to the furloughs and the disruption that will cause in the economy, throughout the entire economy, 750,000 Fewer jobs will result at the end of the calendar year. So why in the world are we debating a bill that we've already passed, I believe unanimously, one month ago, that does nothing about jobs, nothing about the deficit, rather than take up the proposal we put forward to replace the sequester in a smart and balanced way through targeted cuts, but also the elimination of these tax breaks. And the answer is, unfortunately, that our Republican colleagues, many of whom have signed that Grover Norquist pledge, have said that they're not willing to close one tax loophole for the purpose of reducing the deficit. Not one penny. We hear all the talk about reducing the deficit, but no. You can't take away one tax break for a corporate jet to reduce the deficit. You can't say to a hedge fund manager, you're no longer going to get a special tax preference if it means we're going to take that away so we can reduce the deficit. So if we're really concerned about the deficit as we should be, let's get at it in a balanced way and not in the sequester way, which will result in 750,000 fewer American jobs. That's what we should be focused on today, Mr. Speaker. I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Indiana is recognized. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think in this debate today, you're seeing two very different philosophies of how we move forward as a country. One side of the aisle who believes that the key to America's future is raising taxes and growing government. And our side who believes that the key to America's future is controlling spending and giving families tax relief now. Let's use tax reform to put more money in the pocket of the American taxpayer so they can spend it out in the economy. The gentleman mentions uh, the CBO uh, many, many times over and over again and uh, fails to mention that the leadership of CBO has said that a balanced budget in the long term will help grow our economy by as much as 1.7 percent each year annually if we balance this budget. He cites uh, Majority Leader Cantor's statements on uh, the sequester. We have virtual unanimity in this caucus that we need to replace the structure of those $85 billion in cuts, but our side of the aisle believes we need to replace them with other more sensible budget reductions that get this government under control. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with those comments, I yield two minutes to the distinguished gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Duffy. The gentleman from Wisconsin is recognized. Thank you, and I appreciate the gentleman for yielding.
Uh, my good friends across the aisle uh, talk about loopholes, uh, tax reform. Uh, they might forget that over the last two years, this House and this party have put forward legislation that do away with the loopholes as part of a larger tax reform, uh, tax reform proposal. My friend across the aisle continually talks about a smart and balanced way to balance the budget. He talks about responsibility. But if you asked him, Mr. Speaker, for his legislation, when does a Democrat bill balance? When does their budget balance? It never does. Ask him, does it balance in 10, 20, 50 years? How about 100 years? Does your budget balance in 100 years? Never does it balance. That is not a balanced approach. The Senate hasn't put forward a budget in four years. The President's budget. Not one Democrat in this chamber or the Senate voted for, their, uh, for the President's budget. And that one, too, never, never balances. That's not a balanced approach. America deserves better. But on this current legislation, America and Americans have a right to know how much their government is accumulating in debt in their name. Grandparents and parents, they have a right to know how much debt is going to be passed off to their grandchildren and their children, those little preschoolers, those toddlers, those infants that are going to inherit this massive debt. They have a right to know. How about those young, young adults that are getting out of, out of high school, in tech school, and out of college? They have a right to know as they look at their car loans, at their, at their student loans, at that new house loan. They have a right to know how much they're going to inherit and pay back over the course of their working years of this irresponsible debt. Americans have a right to know. This legislation is important because this is the first step to making sure America knows the fiscal trouble we're in and to encourage our friends across the aisle to get together and not use terminology of a balanced approach, but actually give us a balanced budget. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Indiana reserves. The gentleman from Maryland. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the American public does have a right to know. I don't know how many times we have to say this on the floor of this House. We passed virtually the identical bill 30 days ago, approximately. And I'm not objecting to this bill. People have a right to know. We should have transparency. We should reduce the deficit. And this bill does nothing to reduce the deficit. What we need to do is make sure that we get our deficits under control, that we stabilize the debt, and that we make smart choices for the people in this country. Yes, there is a difference of opinion. We believe that as part of reducing the deficit, we should make targeted smart cuts, but we should also cut some of those tax loopholes. Now, the gentleman mentioned that we'd uh, passed uh, a, a tax increase on $600 billion over the next 10 years. That's right. We finally said for higher income earners, you're going to go back to paying the same rates as you were during the Clinton administration. But the gentleman suggested that budget history began on January 1st of this year. We were all here, not everybody, but most of us, when we passed the Budget Control Act in the summer of 2011. What do we do in that act? We capped spending. $1.5 trillion in spending reductions. That was the right thing to do. Now we've done $600 billion in revenue. So I think most people can do the math on this. Uh, we're not nearly close to the kind of ratios that the Bipartisan Commission, the Bipartisan Fiscal Commission, Simpson Bowles, we're not close to the balance they talked about in terms of revenue and cuts, not even in the ballpark. So let's focus on the fundamental question, which is, number one, getting the economy moving again, not losing 750,000 jobs this year, and then reducing our deficits in a smart and balanced way uh, over a period of time. But yes, by all means, let's have the president do a calculation, which one of the earlier Republican speakers did on the floor of the House. Um, we can all do that. Of course, as I indicated, that calculation changes day to day. But by all means, let's get it. But let's not pretend that this piece of legislation does one thing to create one job or reduce the deficit by one penny. I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves the balance of his time. The gentleman from Indiana is recognized.
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield two minutes to the distinguished gentleman from Indiana, my good friend, Mr. Young. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today in support of my friend, neighbor, uh, colleague, and fellow Hoosier, Mr. Messer, and his bill, H.R. 668. This le legislation would require the President's budget proposal to make clear the per-taxpayer cost of any budget deficits. Now, we've repeatedly heard President Obama proclaim his desire to have the most transparent administration in history. In furtherance of that objective, then, this should be welcome legislation to all parties. To many Americans and to many of my colleagues, federal budgeting might seem like an abstraction and thus unimportant because dollar amounts in, in terms of billions and trillions of dollars are, are beyond normal human comprehension. Most people just don't think in those terms. In fairness, most of us don't think in those terms. So let's clarify this process by bringing these numbers down to the individual level. Let's tell the American people, for example, under the President's last budget, you owe $7,000 just to cover the deficit. That resonates. Folks get that. The math is pretty simple. The median income in Indiana is around $45,000. Income and payroll taxes will eat up about $9,000 of that. People will understand what it means when you tell them that under, under the President's budget, you need almost 20 percent more per year, per Hoosier, just to balance the budget. Now, this is important, contrary to some of the things we heard earlier. Maybe this bill will even help incentivize those who are drafting budgets in the future to put together the budgets that actually balance at some point in the distant future so that we don't have to rely on these suboptimal cutting gimmicks like the President's sequester to in some way get spending under control. We know revenue will double over the next 10 years. We know we have a spending problem, not a revenue problem in this country. So it's time the federal government, and the White House in particular, comes clean about the direct impact of our federal deficits on our nation's family. So I urge my colleagues to support this measure of good government by voting yay for H.R. 668, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Maryland is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. May I ask how much time remains on each side? Two minutes, two minutes. The gentleman from Maryland has two minutes, and the gentleman from Indiana has three minutes. All right. Does the gentleman have any other speakers? One more speaker. Why don't I reserve the balance of my time? And... Thank you. Reserves the balance of his time. The, the gentleman from Indiana is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I yield two minutes to another very good friend of mine, the third Hoosier speaking and good friend speaking on uh, this bill today, the distinguished gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Stutzman. Uh, thank you uh, to my friend uh, from Indiana. This is, I believe, the uh, fifth speaker from Indiana. Uh, maybe we're getting something right in Indiana. I don't know what it is, but uh, uh, thank you for carrying this bill. Um, we do have a balanced budget in Indiana. Uh, we have uh, uh, made sure that we have taken care of the children in education. We've made sure that our law enforcement is taken care of, but we've also made those difficult choices early on that Washington could really learn from in, uh, in budgeting. So I appreciate uh, Congressman Messer from, for bringing this particular bill. It's, it's a good government bill. And, um, and I know the other side of the aisle is talking about the sequester, and, and I found it ironic that the uh, Washington Times today has a headline that says uh, 400 more jobs are created in spite of the sequester. So I don't believe that the sky is falling here. This legislation requires the president to do some simple math and include with his budget, should he choose to submit one, an estimate of the cost of the deficit per taxpayer. Taxpayers just simply deserve to know how much they owe for Washington's out-of-control spending. After all, every dime that the federal government borrows is saddled on this generation and the next generation and generations to follow. Right now, the cost of Washington's $16 trillion of national debt totals more than $147,000 per taxpayer. In fact, approximately every minute, Mr. Speaker, the federal government borrows another $4 million per minute, leaving this generation empty promises and massive debt. This is no way to run a government. If the president refuses to break the cycle of bailouts, borrowing, and, taxpayer, uh, and tax hikes, taxpayers deserve to know the true cost 
of the President's irresponsible decisions. The American taxpayers deserve transparency, and that's exactly what this bill does. Mr. Speaker, I applaud the, uh, my colleague from Indiana, and I thank him for bringing this bill to the floor, and I urge the support of all of my colleagues here in the House of Representatives, and with that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Maryland is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and it's always good to see a, sh a show of Hoosier, Hoosier unity on the floor of the House, and I look forward to joining my colleagues in voting for this bill. And the state of Maryland also has a balanced uh, budget, uh, but we also have a capital budget and other parts uh, that we do differently. Look, Mr. Speaker, um, I'm going to support this bill. I support transparency. I supported virtually the identical provision 30 days ago. That's really not not the issue. Yes, we want more information, and we'll get it. Uh, but the real issue here is the loss of jobs. Now, the previous gentleman mentioned that the Washington Times has an article saying more jobs were created. Thank goodness we are finally seeing more and more jobs created. We will have economic growth. There will be jobs created. The question is how many fewer jobs we will have as a result of the sequester. The CBO hasn't said it will stop every job from being created. What the Chairman of the Federal Reserve has said and what the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office has said is that this sequester, if it remains in place through the end of the year, will be a drag on growth. So we will have fewer jobs created. In fact, they estimate we will have 750,000 fewer American jobs by the end of the year if we don't do something about the sequester. So, Mr. Speaker, I just go back to the original question. Why take up something we've already done, already passed virtually unanimously, when we have a much more pressing issue? And when we today will ask for the fourth time this year, when it counts, to vote on a bill that would replace the sequester in a smart and balanced way without the loss of jobs? That's the fundamental question. And why this House is shirking that responsibility and refusing to hold a vote on a proposal that would prevent the loss of 750,000 jobs is a question I think the American people are asking themselves. So, Mr. Speaker, let's get on to the Gentleman's pressing time business. Is let's focus on jobs and really reducing the deficit and not, not playing these kind of uh, games on the floor of the House. Thank you. Gentleman from Indiana. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Appreciate the gentleman's uh, help and comments on this bill. It's a good government bill. It's transparency. It makes sure that taxpayers know how much the federal government is racking up on, on their dime, and, and I'm, I'm hopeful that it will pass. The gentleman makes a very important point that this bill is, is not to cure all of the world, and we have lots of work to do. Far too many families in this economy have had to come home and, and deal with a job loss. I remind uh, everybody in this chamber that the $85 billion what, that we're talking about in this sequester, while a lot of money, is 2 percent of our total federal government uh, $3.6 trillion budget. It's two pennies on every dollar. We agree that this uh, sequester should be replaced. We disagree on how surely we can find two pennies to save instead of raising taxes and taking more money out of the pocket of the American taxpayer. With that, I close, Mr. Speaker. Uh, both gentlemen's time has expired. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass the bill, H.R. 668? Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, two-thirds being in the affirmative. Mr. Speaker, I ask for the vote. Does the gentleman ask for the yeas and nays? Yes. The yeas and nays are requested. All those in favor of taking this vote by the yeas and nays will rise and remain standing until counted. A sufficient